Shopify will ship on quality. Atlassian will ship on speed. You don't build a product, you build a movement. I believe that one of the things that slows teams down the most is what I call time horizon friction. And time horizon friction is caused by a lot of process. And that process is you have a lot of people who want to put plans in place and they feel comfort. Jean-Michel, I've heard so many good things from Scott, from Harley. I mean, just brilliant references. What more could you want? But uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure to be here. Finally. Uh, finally. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of context. So I always find that like, finding one's love in life is actually quite rare. Many people don't actually find their love. And so I wanted to start on yours. When did you first fall in love with product and tech? And can you take me to that moment? It's, I think love's a good word. I think, I, I think we, we use that word kind of, we throw it around, but I, I think love is a good word of describing where I'm at. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So I got into computer things through uh, fine arts in high school. So we're going back to 1988. I'm in high school and I, there's just too many things I like doing. So I picked, I'm going to do fine arts and music and math. And I ignored everything in between. I've never taken any biology class. I've never taken any history. I did literally did fine arts, music, and math. So my days were, you know, drawing and painting, music, band class, and then I did I did math. And then at one year, I told the band leader, I said, "Hey, my parents got me a computer, and it turns out that there's this protocol called MIDI, and I can I have a keyboard, and I know we're doing a Phantom of the Opera, Les Misérables mix. What if I did all the music for it, like myself? You don't need the band." And she was like, that's crazy. And I was like, I was like, I think I can pull it off. So I used this program called Cubase, like version 1.1 in 1988. And um, I guess this is way before AI, but I basically fired the high school band. I didn't have to do anything for the whole musical that year. And I pulled off um, a Les Mis Phantom of the Opera medley. Uh, with my computer and my keyboard. And I, I recorded, a, you know, I recorded a bunch of tracks. I did, you know, some stuff. And then I did one, I played one live. And, um, you know, fat, that was like, I was in grade 11 or something. I'm in grade 13 and I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? And my guidance counselor was like, I think you should go into this computer thing. I'm like, ah, oh, but my parents, like, I mean, they don't know any, like, I know no one who does this for a career. Like, I was just doing this for fun. And, um, she was right. I went into computer science and never looked back. So I think I, I stumbled into it kind of young, but I, I've, I've always seen computers as a tool. You know, for me, it was like, hey, it's really cool that I could do this thing. Like this computer is like a, a companion, a co-pilot for creativity, you know? So that's, I, I never got into like pro, I was not like a programmer. I was like a computer is like a tool that can make really cool shit happen. Right. And so that's how I, I fell in love with it. A weird one, but one I've been oscillating on a lot recently is I think, you know, the safe path is never as safe as you think. And the risky path is never as risky as you think. And I, I say that to a lot of people considering entering the workforce today. When you think back about your entry, your love of product there, what do you advise graduates, people entering workforces listening to you now? You know, like people always say, do something you love. And I'm like, maybe I've heard this. I'm like, do something you're good at, you know? So, um, you know, in some ways, my guidance counselor was like, hey, it looks like you're good at it. There's kind of no wrong path if you keep doing something you're good at. And it turned out I was, you know, I, yeah, I was good you at very, it. So she's like, keep doing it, right? You were very good at it. And it led to like key, key leadership roles at Shopify, at Atlassian, which is obviously how you're so close to Harley and um, Scott. I want to ask, they're very seismic organizations and they have big impacts on people's minds. How did, if you were to one takeaway from each on how it impacted your mindset, Shopify and Atlassian, what would it be, Jean-Michel? Yeah, it's a good question. So from band class to, you know, uh, leading and growing kind of the engineering orgs at these two companies that at the time had no idea where they're, they're going to be so massive. Um, and seeing both from the inside, I'd say Shopify and Atlassian are really interesting. If you drew a Venn diagram of both companies, there's an overlap and there's a non-overlap of both. So the overlap is, um, and I, I learned from both, is founders playing the long game and good at marketing. And that might be a bit weird coming from an engineering dude, but like founders playing the long game. So making these decisions that, you know, I guess staying alive long enough that you just, you know, you'll be around longer. Um, and they're both brilliant at marketing, right? Harley, Mike, and Scott, like they, they knew the value of, of, of getting eyeballs. And as an engineer building things, I, I was kind of at the time when I, when I met all these folks was heads down, just trying to make things work, loving building companies, building teams together. But I think the value of investing and getting eyeballs was um, something I learned from both. I'm just too interested. What are an example from each on how they played the long game strategically? 
Well, strategically, both invested in a, in building communities around their company, right? Like you don't you don't build a product, you build a movement. And um, Atlassian built a movement around open source, like twenty years ago, um, around you know easy software and getting people really excited about it. Right? They did things like um, like cash for clunkers. They were going after Joel Spolsky at the time. It just built a movement around like how people work. Right? Um, their vision was you know empower you know. Um, everyone working on teams, right? They built a movement around that. Shopify, same thing. What did Shopify do? They, you know, um, I think at the time, Harley and Toby got in touch with um, Tim Ferriss. Like, hey, you wrote a book at the four hour work week. That's, there's a movement around being an entrepreneur, you know? So Shopify wasn't about the product. It was about a movement of like, let's build this thing around entrepreneurship. And it's not like that was accidental. Like, we had meetings about, you know, I think, you know, we have to create a, a movement around entrepreneurship. And it turns out we have one product for that now. We might have multiple in the future but that's what we want to do. And both those companies did that really, really well. I learned so much because as an engineer, again, as a product person, you know, maybe the most important thing to do is, is, you know, get a group of people together that care about what you care about as much. And I think both companies have done that amazingly. I mean, God, you're good at sound bites. I don't look for companies. I look for movements. That is just like the most Twitter worthy quote. I love that. I, where do they not overlap then? If they overlap there in terms of long game and movements and communities, where are they distinctly different? I'm curious. What do you think? What do you, 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 you know, both you've interviewed both. Let, let's compare notes. Where do you where do you think they don't overlap? Huh. <laughs> Am I well, allowed I'm, to do that? Can I ask you questions? You can, but I'm just going to lose friends. I mean, listen. I think Harley is creatively astonishing, uh, a brilliant communicator externally, and is a fantastic face of a company pushing a message, driving a community. And I think Scott, on the flip side is internally one of the most assured, controlled, strategic thinkers, resource allocators, and leaders, very much focused on internal operations and optimization. So different mindsets completely, actually, in terms of how they run companies. Yeah, and I think I think one, one thing you're not seeing is, is there's pairs of people, right? There's Harley and Toby, and then there's Scott and Mike, yeah. right? So exactly. all these companies have... Um, a bunch of really good people who are who are making decisions and i think the 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 non overlapping i saw the most from from the inside was um shopify will ship on quality atlassian will ship on speed yeah and i think that's culturally like atlassian does a lot of stuff you go to their web page and there's a lot of products they've a lot of m a there's there's a lot right there, there's a lot and i think that was driven culturally i think the founders are very you know like they realize that that they're good at acquiring, turning that into monetization and using their, you know, like using their pool of customers really well. Uh, there's no opinion. Both turned into really great companies. At Shopify, we spend a lot more time on doing less things. And then from the outside, you might say, well, we did a lot, but less things. And we would, and especially Toby would, would uh, stop things based on quality, which I would not see as much as it lasts. Now, both companies, you know, obviously evolved since then, have done a lot of things, but you can still see that. I think Atlassian was a crazy good business in terms of like, as you said, Scott's really good at, at, at numbers. I remember seeing spreadsheets of spreadsheets of here's what, you know, last thing is going to look like in 2020 and 2010, you know, it all turned in to, and, and it was all around just really good mechanics of how, how to, how to create big, great businesses. Right. At, um, and, and Shopify, I think great business. I think the product is really, really good. I think that we, ex we didn't extract as much business. Right. <laughs> but here's the other thing to realize when you build a company, you have one thing to do is like build a product that people can use and they love it and they tell their friends about it, right? Like you can, and you, you have 10, if you do that for 10 years and you figure out how to monetize it over time, like that's an okay position to be in, right? And, and you've got to monetize enough to keep going, but you have some flexibility in how you're going to do those levers, which means that if you spend too much time looking at the spreadsheets, you're going to forget, you're going to forget about your priority number one, which is you have to get people to love your product and tell their friends about it. And then actually like yell to their friends about it, which I think both companies have done, have done really well. And then the way you monetize that, I mean, if it's a long game, maybe the first 10 years, you break even, you're making some profit and you, you've got some levers to play, right? And I think both, both companies use those levers differently. And I have no idea 
what both have been extremely successful, but it's really interesting to see um, kind of two different playbooks played out by two companies. You said they're like, make your customers love it. I literally just tweeted this afternoon. If you want your customers to love you more, narrow the scope of your ICP. They will love you more because your products will fit them more tightly. The features will be more aligned and they will tell their friends more because it is more aligned to them and their friends will be more than you think you will always under do you agree if you want more customers narrow the scope of your icp and make fewer people love it more i think in your in your first um couple of years absolutely and i think um whoever said this i'm not sure where this comes from but you know companies are going to die um from indigestion before they die of starvation uh, which means that we all have way too many ideas in our brain and our instinct is to give everyone everything and it's really hard to say no. So um, you're absolutely true, right? So it's it's um, give people a couple of things that are really, really good and then buy you time to figure out what the next things are. So if we think about the two kind of different worlds that you mentioned, which was speed versus kind of quality, for founders, again, that listen, that are in their first three years, say, we have, you know, 700,000 that listen, Um how should they think? Is speed of execution everything or is build slow, but build right the right way at that stage? Do both that fits what you've got to do, you know, and I'm like, I'm in the middle of the building. So I, you know, I did the shop fight lasting thing, hyperscale, and I've, I've done the one to N a lot, right? Which is the, after you've product market fit, everything breaks. And how do you put the pieces back together and, and build a company and an organization to get to, you know, all, you know, hundred X that. Um, I haven't done the zero to one in a while. So one of the things I've been doing for the last year is a zero to one again, and just prove I can go back to band class and, and play my instruments. And, uh, one of the, f I'm, I'm living this viscerally right now, which is that debate of like speed versus quality. The good decision is every month pick, you know, half the things that have to be polished, like they're like the best things on the planet and half of them don't have to be. You know, and that's, and that's where you actually get long-term momentum, which is polish the things that you want, you know, you know, your customers are going to go, holy shit. Like I just use this app, blah, blah. And it's does X, Y, Z like amazingly. And then the other stuff, like, you know, they're not probably going to talk to their friends about, right? So for me, that's the thing of just like every month there's like half I'm doing, I'm going to rush it. And in half I'm not. So the question to you and these founders then is like, what's in each bucket, not pick one bucket. Like that'd be stupid, but what's in each bucket and and how do you like how do you know that every month and how do you readjust that every month are there things that should be always in one bucket versus another so like should security always be in the like spend time on it bucket should whatever that may be payments but whatever the, are there certain elements where you're like you can't shortcut it like yeah every month there's stuff you can't shortcut absolutely so i'd say um like for me in my in my current startup i was like i want to run this like you know, my experience, I, like, I'd love to build a multi-million dollar business with the least amount of people possible. So I was like, how do I do that? I was like, okay, well, there's, there's obviously some technical foundations we have to put in place so that, you know, I'm not woken up at night or I, I don't have to hire a bunch of people. Like, so we, I did spend a bit of time getting some of that in place, obviously. And I'd say the designers we work with, like, I've got this designer who's really good. And I think that honestly, it's a weekly debate. <laughs> on on what we do now one, one one thing i did help put things in those bucket is um i'm very keen on having like habits that force you to make some decisions quickly so our designer wants to have a lot of meetings because they're like let's talk about you know features and let's talk about what we're going to do i'm like we have one hour a week we're, we're not going to talk more than one hour a week as a team they're like why why is that <laughs> because because I want us to really focus. And if we only have one hour to talk about things, we can't talk about stuff we're going to do in two months from now. Right. So, so often, often companies, the way that they lose time and get slow is not just about like what to do fast or slow, but they end up talking about too much stuff that won't happen for three or four months. So what I've been trying to ha have it is like, we've got a vision together. Cool. Like we know where we want to be in three years. So like it's super easy. Right. Um, and then we, we time, we time cap stuff. This week, what we're talking about, we're talking about what we're building this week, and we're going to talk about what we're setting up to build next month, and that's it. And so I think, um, sorry, we're going off on random tangents, but I think one of the ways you get speed and quality is by time capping things and then deciding as a team, again, what has to be polished, what doesn't have to be. And I think it it's thrown my team for a loop a bit, which is I just don't want to talk about that much. That doesn't matter. And no one does that. Everyone, Everyone's way too polite. Everyone wants to talk about stuff that's going to happen in the future. I'm like... Either we're if it's either it's shipping this week, 
or we're going to discuss a direction of something and we, you know, we have to exchange some ideas, but it's time capped. And I think that's given us a huge amount of speed, but it's been very culturally jarring for people. How do you measure progress and how do you approach goal setting to assure input aligns to output achieved? I just look at code too. Like I'm like, how much do we ship? Like it's super, like, as I say, uh, code talks and bullshit walks, which is, I see where we're shipping, you know, and I'm like, is it good? I, um, you kind of, you see, we shipped this stuff this week. Cool. That's progress, right? That we, and, and it's not, are we doing more than last week? It's like, we're just, we have a consistent hum of, we ship this kind of stuff right every week and it ebbs and flows, you know, there's, but over time I'm like, if we can keep that cadence up, I'm, I'm kind of happy. Right. And I literally just look at the PRs and the code that we ship and how, how, you know, how much time we spend on that. And that's, that's literally all the progress. And I, that's the exact same measure I had at Shopify, by the way. Like it's not, it's not different. There's no magic thing. I'm like, I was like, what are we shipping? And, um, and, and then you have to look at, there's, there's things that you ship that are different, right? There's some things that are one line of code. There's, there could be some magic in one line of code. So it's not necessarily like number of lines of code, but it's just, you see this velocity happening in things shipping and you just, you, you get, there's this like humming in a company of shipping. And I think when you, when you see that happening and it's not a hum of meetings, it's not a hum of we're talking about stuff, but it's like, after all that filtering, if you discuss, you align is like, can you keep shipping stuff for me is like the ultimate measure. It's a very direct approach with no fluff. And it makes me think to one of your tweets, which I loved. You said, I've retired from software process, no scrum, DDs, TDD, standups, a, a load of other things. Instead, we just build and run software together. Software teams are built on process, as you know. Why is that wrong? Why are you issuing that? Can you just talk to me about why you don't need it now? Yeah, and as, as you can tell as we're talking, I'm, I'm probably overly maniacal about um, waste, <laughs> maybe put it that way, right? Um, and, you know, I think that I've been pulled into the whole, there's a process that's going to make me better, right? Like there's, there's a thing there, like there's a way I should be working. That's going to be better. That's going to bring something out of me. And what I realized a lot of, you know, and, and a lot of this came out of like some of the last years at Shopify, you know, as I was, you know, programming the organization and trying to get the most out of people is, is, um, we put process in place. Like you put process in place because you got people and, and, and some of it's there. But I, what I realized is, is at the end of the day, what just really mattered was like a couple of people making some really good decisions and, and us writing code and, and, and getting like, it's almost like your architecture is your strategy. So I was like, why don't we spend more time talking about that versus who's doing what? And are we have, do we have story points? And um, like one really, really good example is I, I believe that one of the things that slows teams down the most is what I call time horizon friction, right? So we, so if you think about slowing down, it's physics, right? Like so there's some friction in place that's going to slow you down. So I call it time horizon friction. Friction. And time horizon friction is caused by um, a lot of process. And that process is you have a lot of people who want to put plans in place and, and, and they feel comfort. You, you talked about how do you get comfort in progress is some people get comfort in planning progress. They go, man, we're we're freaking nailing it. Like we've got plans for these 10 things and we got, I've got a good roadmap and I've got good, um, you know, I've got people that are really excited about what we're building next. And then I was, I, I was realizing like, I was like, Shopify slowing down in these places. And then you, I do an audit of like, of things and we're like, we've got, you know, we have planning process. We have, we have to write briefs. We've got to get roadmaps aligned. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, and you know what happens then is you end up having, more meetings about work that you're not doing yet than you are doing the actual work. So, so I call it time horizon friction because you're planning the future and you're not building the present and think about an organization. And, and I'm sure people listening, you've all lived. This is you have a lot of people who can't write code in a company, but they're going to see progress as having plans. So they're going to have plans, but the only way to have plans is you have to talk to people writing code because you're going to put a plan together. And you go, can we do this? How long is it going to take? So you end up having meetings with people doing the planning to help you do the planning with the people who are doing the building. You see that. And then, so you end up having this bottleneck of, of way too much planning happening for the actual output of building. And you can't plan without the builders. So at some point I was like, what if we just cut out this plan? Like this planning process has to be completely thrown out. And I bet most companies completely like over plan a hundred X, right? They like, it, I'm not saying you don't plan. I'm saying you should just plan enough. Now what's enough. I don't know. So 
I I'm swinging the pendulum personally now because I believe there's there's a there's a a model of progress and and shipping things that you can take a lot of cruft out and I'm in this experiment now of taking as much cruft as I can out and building and time capping and I'm absolutely loving it. I've never felt as productive. I feel like we're getting so much shit done and um and that's why I tweeted <laughs> I'm retiring from process. What does yours look like today then? Just build in silence on your own and ship. No, no, it's, it's super easy. It's like, we just said, where do we want to be in three years? Like, you need to chat about that. Like, like, what are we about? Okay, what are we, what are we about? What are we not about? Cool. And we talk about that, you know, we realign it every quarter or whatever, like, cool. And then we're like, what are we doing next? And next month? Cool. So I literally, I go into linear, I, we write, we have a meeting, we write, what are we doing next, next month? Cool. And we have one, a one hour meeting a week on who's stuck. That's it. That's literally all we do. And we ship and, and you write code. Like you just, you write your product, we ship it, we run builds, like all the other shit. Like there's no, but you'd be surprised at the, t like it makes everyone on my team very uncomfortable because we've, we've all been, I think, indoctrinated into planning reduces risk. And I think shipping reduces risk. So as a company, your job is to reduce the most risk possible. And I just really believe shipping does that. Is there a scale of company size where this process or lack of process no longer is possible. If you no, look at, I, I believe, I believe Toby at Shopify is implementing this exact same thing. I think we're doing it in parallel universes, and we will have beer every summer and compare notes. But I, I, I strongly believe that some of the shift that Toby and and Harley have been making it at, at Shopify are are to get towards this. Now, I'm not saying align alignment's not important. You have to you have to be aligned. Like a a one percent difference in trajectory between the earth and the sun, 1% puts you 1.2 million miles away from the sun. So, so there's like, people can drift and teams can drift. Right. Um, so the question is like, how do you align? And there's a million ways of doing that, that are very ineffective and some ways that are way more effective at aligning. Do you know what? I'm enjoying this way too much. I was like, fuck that. Standing is just... You're sitting down now. Old. Okay, maybe I'll I'm stand sitting up. Down. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, re I'm ready to like dive in here. So I, I totally agree and I totally get you. Is there anything you think that Toby has to do differently in the way that he's creating this structure compared to how you do it in the way that you're creating your structure? I think it's based on... on similar principles. What's really interesting is I think, I think Toby and I both understand that there's some sociologic things in, not in the way, but that we're conditioned to, right? So just think about what it was like in school for you, right? When you were in school, you go, you're given an assignment, you take the assignment and your job's to go away and get an A plus on the assignment, right? And not only that, you're not even allowed to talk to, you can't even talk to people. You can't even like get help on that assignment. Like it's crazy. So you've, we've got like 21 years indoctrinated in getting a homework assignment, going away and coming back. And then we're like, we throw you into the workforce and we're like, by the way, now your job is to cheat as much as you can. I'm going to give you assignment and you could cheat. You better cheat, right? You better be looking at shortcuts, trying to find other ways of doing it and, and, and cheating. Right. And, um, I think, I, I think as we're building companies, just getting people in the mode of like, these aren't homework assignments where you, you get it perfect and you go away. You've got to cheat, right? You've got to build prototypes. You've got to look at other people. You've got to get feedback. You've got to put it in the wild and see if it doesn't break right away. There's, there's like so many things that we've got to do when we actually build things in the real world and real companies that, We've got to unprogram from all these people who are in school doing homework assignments and trying to get an A plus and not cheating. So, so I think, you know, that's something that we've got to really almost beat out of people in our education system to get people to actually build things, and especially like, you know, technically and engineering and product of just like that, that rhythm of building things I, I think is, is different. And that's why I'm, I think swinging the pendulum here is, is really interesting. I'm just, you know, get kids to like, let's write the code, let's build it. How do you know it's going to work? And, and, and I think we're going to get velocity out of doing that versus just talking about things with less process people monitoring becomes difficult you hire someone and you don't know the first three months you're getting to know each other but with less process is it not harder to understand new team member quality than before the only thing we should judge ourselves by is is that output that people are going to see right like our customers never see the sausage factory of how many meetings we have and what process we use they're only going to see the output so let's evaluate ourselves on on how good we see the output and you know one of the things that i you know when i do performance review for for executives and managers that work for me like the first question i ask is cool what did your team ship and can you just rank for me uh what was good 
versus what was great. And I just, I want their opinion. Right. And for me, that that's a really good way. Like I need everyone in the company to like f- understand what we're shipping. How do you, how do we build some uh, shared understanding of what great is and what good is? And um, I want to see an organization where we have the most amount of people possible asking themselves that question. And what's great is there's no, there's no perfect answer of like, like I'm, I'm waiting to make sure I was like, but I, I need someone who has that, that like you need everyone in the company who has that internal barometer of like looking at things that we're shipping and going, like, how would I know if that was great? Like, how would I know if that email I sent to the customer was great? Like, you should know that, right? You should. Be, so when you're writing it, then, and you should be building it and getting better all the time. And I think if you build an organization where you don't reward yourself by what process you use, but you reward yourself by a shared understanding of what great looks like and, and building towards that, I think that's that's I think that's how you get better. And I like, for example, I think in a you know a you know a review of of you know your your VP of engineering, you should be looking at the code that that team shipped. I, I agree completely. I, I'm, I'm thinking to something that you've actually said before, though, when it comes to people and talent management, which is the worst advice is hire great people and get out of the way. <laughs> I've, I've always believed that. And so can you help me understand why is that such bad advice? So the context here is everyone's heard of that phrase, right? I'm thinking like it must be written in like a bazillion Harvard management books, right? Like hire great people and get out of the way. Um, you know, like, and I believed it. I was like, holy shit. Like that's the most, like that makes so much sense. Right. Because everyone's love loves autonomy. You know, I'm like, just give people autonomy. And what I realized building companies is if you're trying to get a bunch of people together and have a shared understanding of what great looks like, it's messy. <laughs> to do that. Like, there's no way you do that by letting people go in their own direction. Right. Like there's, there's like a, I I think the Steve jobs analogy, there's a rock tumbler that you're going to be in together to figure out how you're going to polish things, how you get a shared alignment. So, so for me, you know, hiring great people in another way is like, is basically an indicate is uh, assuming that everyone is magically going to have the same understanding of the world is magically going to have the same quality bar is magically going to be aligned on how they do things like is impossible to happen. Right. So, um, so I think it's, it's not only do I think it's a bad, I've seen the biggest train wrecks in companies happen because bosses do that or VPs or CEOs, they hire people and they let them run. And, and my thesis here is why it's, it's, it's absolutely terrible is, and, and why I'm very strongly saying that is because I think people believe it's really good. And the second thing is the only way you get, um, you get that level of autonomy is when you actually, you know, align on a lot of things together. So I'll give you a really concrete example. Um, when I would onboard new VPs that would work for me, I would very, and I would very clearly say, and this is, I'm not smart. I just, I learned this over many, many years is I would go, listen, we're going to spend a lot of time together. We're going to spend time together. Like we were pair programming, like we used to do when we were, you know, programming all day, we're going to pair program on leadership. And the reason we're going to pair program is it is as complex as programming. Like there's typos, there's bugs. It's, it's hard. And the only way we can get to know each other is we're going to have to pair program on leadership. And the way we do that is, um, there's, there's a couple of things that I've, I've noticed in the org that I really want you to ship, right? X, there's three things in the next six months that listen, I'm going to make it easy. There's, you don't have to find these. There's three things we have to ship that I'd like you to, to lead. And I'd like you during that time, I'd like you to find three other things that we should do that are really important. Right. And, and then what's really cool is we're like, I'm not, I'm not going, you know, here's exactly all the things you're going to do for the next year. I'm just, I'm, I'm helping the, the, kind of the onboarding. I'm like, let's get, let's get aligned on, on how you ship things. So I'd go, for example, like really great guy. His name's Farhan. He's, I think he runs engineering at Shopify now. I hired Farhan and you know, he's almost too smart. He knows he's looking at everything. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, Farhan, I know you have all these ideas. Here's three things we're going to do. We have to become, we want to become, uh, the best company for react native on the planet. We're making a bet on react native and I need you to publish a blog post and do some research on what we're doing internally in React Native. I'd love you to lead the mobile team to get us reoriented around React Native and come up with uh, and make sure we ship. We're redoing POS, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Uh, those three things. And then cool. I'm like, can I review your blog post? And then we probably went back and forth on it five, six times together. And I was like, cool. I was like, hey, I'd say that differently. Why? Oh, that's super interesting. We got to know each other in this super fun way of just shipping stuff together, right? Instead of talking about, I was like, can you write that thing? Let's, let's 
oh, I, I, I hadn't thought about doing that. That's really smart. That's cool. I learned something from Farhan. And then the flip side, he's like, oh, Jean-Michel, I didn't see things that way, right? So we got into this, like, this, this pairing mode of really getting to know each other. And then by year two and three, I'm like, Farhan, what do you want to work on? Like, we kind of know each other at that point, right? But that's very different onboarding and very different philosophy than I think a lot of companies, they feel that any, any premise of command and control is like, is, is like, like a, a religious faux pas now, right? Like if you, if you don't like, um, pray to the autonomy, uh, pulpit and church, you're almost burnt at the stake these days, right? Like, what do you mean autonomy? Everyone wants autonomy. Um, so I, I swing the pendulum. I think that you've got to have a lot of high alignment. And I don't, uh, you don't do alignment by meetings necessarily. Like alignment's not this, we have to talk all the time. Alignment is like sending your boss a Slack message every day going, hey, here's two decisions that I saw. I did ABC. What do you think? Bam. Okay, cool. That's cool. Let's, let's align on decisions. Let's align on, on what did you see and what do I think? Like, like that, you can do these micro alignments all the time that are, that are really, really amazing, you know, to the point where we would hire new executives at Shopfire at Atlassian. And one of the questions I'd ask after, you know, this new CFO or the new CMO had been onboarded for three months, I'd go, hey, how often do you talk to our CEO? And they'd go, you know, they, they kind of knew it was a trick question. And then they'd go, well, 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 we have our one-on-ones every week. I'm like, oh, wow, that's not a lot. <laughs> and they'd be like, what do you mean it's not a lot? I was like, well, I, I, I do at least one Slack a day. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, I don't want to bother them. What do you mean? You mean bother the CEO? Like, I was like, let me tell you something. The only thing on the CEO's mind right now is everyone running off in different directions and not be able to kind of understand what kind of decisions we're making. So I'm like, I share a decision every day with the CEO by Slack or by email, like depending. And, like I'll, and I'm like, they don't have to respond to me. I'm just doing these micro alignments of like, hey, I saw this thing. What do you think? Or, hey, do you see this demo? That's cool. Or I was like, hey, I need a hand with this. So I'm like, I'm such a fan of like these micro alignments that you've got to build into your habits. And I feel that if you... Um, you know, I manage now lots of people across media companies, across funds. I don't want that. I, I, I honestly, if I have, no, I f f respectfully, I trust you. That's why I have you as a, a team member who I respect immensely. I'm full trust battery. I think Toby says the trust battery. I'm up here. I hired you. I pay you really well. Do not send me a message saying you made that decision. Just make the decision and move on. I got enough shit going. Maybe in your world is simpler, but I feel that the world is so complex that there is like... Why would I build a company where I can't use everyone's brain is always the thing I'm thinking about, right? So, so it's like, for me, I'm like, I have to tap into my boss's brain in the, the most effective way possible because that'd be stupid to not tap into everyone's brain. So for me, I see it less as bothering, right? And more as, as I need to tap someone's brain. So we have so many operators that listen. When we think about that, do they then... Like, what can they do to action that very specifically? Do they sit down with their team and say, hey, I would like a Slack every morning with a decision, a update. How can they action this and make that tangible? No, it, ha it has to be a bit more natural than that. And I think there's, um, there's a book by Susan Scott where she introduces a decision tree. And the decision tree is basically how you talk to your team about this. And you go, hey, listen, there's roughly three types of decisions that we're all going to make, right? There's root decisions, there's trunk decisions, and there's leaf decisions. Root decisions are kind of really important. <laughs> they're, they might be one-way doors. They're hard to undo, right? Trunk decisions are, you know, medium size, you know, and then leafs are, they don't matter, right? So, like, let's talk about the roots together. And, and don't surprise me, right? Make sure that the trunks, we should brain, like, if you want to brainstorm, I'm always available for that. Like, I always want to learn something from you and maybe I can bring some input and leash, as you said, don't bug me about that, right? So as you say, like your, I think your approach of like, I hired you big bucks, go away. I think, I think is a bit naive in a sense. And I, maybe naive is not dark, but it's, it's simplistic, right? Where I think building companies where there's a lot going on, there's a lot of micro decisions to be made that make a difference. You know, like, like sometimes like we're going to put the code there versus there sounds like I just trust you versus that's a root decision because that's going to lead on to a lot of other things. There's no, there's no bad reason in getting a couple of uh, points of feedback. So that Susan Scott book and that framework, I think is a great way to sit down with your team going, Hey, there's three types of decisions we're going to be ma making. Um, these ones I care a lot about these ones I don't versus I don't care about them all, which is, I think is going to be a train wreck. Sean, Michelle, I like you. 
you turn questions back on me and then call me naive. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, I'm just going to blame no. my uh, English isn't my first language. So can I? No, I think it's fantastic. I love a discussion. God, it's so boring when everyone says I agree. Fuck, that's terrible. So no, uh, wonderful. My question to you is then, if we think about you know these brilliantly talented people who we want to give us these updates, you got to get them in the door first. You've hired unbelievable teams. You know, Harley and Scott told me about your hiring abilities and scaling teams. How do you structure the hiring process and what are the stages for you? Because it's really hard to know and do. Man, hiring is really hard. Um, it's really hard. So I, I, there's kind of like a three-step process. Oh, I'm not the process guy. Three things I think are important. The first thing is, I call it the snowboard test, which is, uh, its premise around the snowboard test is, I can't get another human to do something they don't really naturally want to do, right? So I'm like, just generally, like with my kids and my dog and cat, like if they don't want to do something, like it's not going to happen. So the snowboard test is, um, it's the way that you find out if someone is a left, is goofy or not goofy on a snowboard, right? So goofy, depending on what foot you put forward. So the snowboard test is you push someone from behind without them noticing, and you look at what foot they put forward. That's their natural instinct, right? So I'm always thinking about it in an interview process. I'm like, how do I give you a, a snowboard test where it's completely unbiased, but I learn the most about what drives you? You know, like, so, so one question for that would be, I was like, listen, I'm, I'm interviewing, you know, some exec role or something or someone senior. And I'm like, listen, you know, their question would be, you know, tell me about the job. I'm like, listen, let's, let's not get into that right away. I'm like, you kind of know what, what we do as a company. I, I assume you've done a bit of research. I've got so many jobs, jobs open. You could do anything here. What's your dream job at Atlassian, at Shopify? What is it? And could you, you know, you talk to me about why that is for 10 minutes, right? So, so that question for me is like the ultimate snowboard test. I want to know what people care about the most, like viscerally care about, because that's when you're not talking together, when you're not with them, that's exactly what they're going to do. So that's step one. And you get to know, like, and often I'm hiring for X and I'm like, oh shit, their instincts are always on Y. Hmm. And then you have a decision. You're like, well, can they do X and you need Y or just um, like, you'll see that. And, and, you know, typically, for example, I'll see, instincts on like they're uh, like i really care about the culture and like cool i really care about the process i really care about the people i really care about the tech i really i really want to do this and and so that 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 first alignment that you have with whoever you're interviewing for me that snowboard test is is great it's super over open ended like um but it, it works really well. Like you get to know kind of viscerally what people want to work on. So that's step one. Step one. I'm going to, I'm going to pep you with questions afterwards. I'm going to let you go through these steps because this is too good. Step two. Okay. So step one is, is you kind of know what their um, instincts are, what they really like to do. Um, step two is I want to know it. The thing that they're really, and I'm going to go with them. Like, I don't distract. I'm like, cool. You want to do that. How are you going to do X? So then I'm like, I'm like, show me how you've done X in the past. So there I'm basically I want them to go into teacher mode to me, which is cool. You want to do X? Absolutely great. I, I won't say, oh, we don't need X. Or I was like, cool, that'd be great. Like, can you entertain me and teach me something about X for the next hour? <laughs> you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll just geek out for an hour, like talk about X. So like, oh, I'd love to, you know, build a system that could do this. And then I'm like, cool. Like, how would you start it? How would, have you done this before? What do you do? Like, go like, then I'm trying to figure out the layers Right. Cause I think, I think great skills for, for anyone, for any human is kind of a, a, a deep appreciation of all the layers that come into problem solving. Right. So like if someone wants to be a great, like, I'd love to build a team and I'm like, cool. Like, do you know, psychology, have you read any books on human motivation? Like, how do you do that? Like, I want to understand someone's playbook in terms of what, what depth they have in that, in that area. Cause they, they, I gave them the snowboard test. They told me they like it. Cool. Like, how much do you really like that? I want, I want to know someone's depth. And again, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just, it's, it's just discovering like what someone, like, do you even like the conversation? Is it fun? Do you, like, I hope after talking to someone about the thing that they really love, that you come away with that, come away out of that chat, super energized and maybe learn one or two things. Like, that's great. I want to work with people like that. Right. So that's step two for me is, is that kind of deep dive understanding depth. Go. Step three. Sorry, I'm writing down so I don't forget. <laughs> this is how you do it when you're a true pro, Jean-Michel. I'm like, this <laughs> got writing on your hand. Yeah, yeah, because I don't want to forget my points, but I want you to finish the three-step process first. So, uh, please, step three, and then we'll go in. Yeah, so, you know, step three then is, um, is going to be obviously, like, talking about, okay, well, here's kind of what the job is, you know, um, 
you go to scale, like hopefully I, I'd like to understand how they, how, how they, they'd approach that, what they've done in the past. And I, I love this one question, which is what's the hardest thing you've built before? Love that. Why do you love that question so much? And what do the best answers elicit or show? Cause I want to know if someone's got a, like an internal quality bar, you know? Mm. So I'm going to like, and I'm on to again, I want to know what, like what they would put on their life's trophy of what they're proud of, you know? And so it, it both gives me an idea of like their level of, um, difficulty you know because you've got this job and you're like i think it's a difficulty 9.5 and then they give you oh the hardest thing i did was x i'm like ooh, that's a 7.2 i was like okay well i think they can stretch right like oh, are they gonna be able to stretch that that's that's cool but and then and then and then that leads you down a lot of things of going well, why do you think it was hard have you seen other people who are doing this what do you what do you like it just i, I just want to get to know someone about what they built Right. Again, about not how do you feel about it? how do you build it? Right. And then and then it was hard. How do you deal with that? How did you get help? Like there's so many twists and turns around just asking someone what they've built and and, and how proud they are about it. So that's that's usually the, the kind of the three questions. And then I, I well, for someone senior, I'll, I'll have them have lunch with other folks. I think it's important that, like, can they get other people to, you know, to to enjoy spending time with them do you care if they've had experience in the industry oh well you know you've, you've got experience building developer tools before uh you've got experience in you know e-commerce and fulfillment or whatever may be the kind of chosen field do you care about experience or do you go no it doesn't matter generally not i think the those three-step process for questioning is really about getting to know that human right about what motivates them what their will is what their skill is and do i think that they can grow you know, like those three things, right, are because are, you, you're putting humans on like a, a growth trajectory of things and matching that with what your company is. Now, there are some, you know, you're building a logistics company, like it'd be good to someone who's been in a warehouse before. Like there is some advantage of doing that. But I'd say there's there's a lot of people you can just throw into the deep end, into, into anything, and they're going to learn it, right? Um, and um, so I, 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 I want people who can grow quickly and people who can um, understand that problems are multi-layered and see that and fix it. I think that's more important. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that founders make when you rev review those three steps and then you look at how founders hire for product and engineering today? Like they're in that order. The top one is a snowboard disc. Like, I don't know how many times I've done it. Like, you know, I'm on the interview panel. I'm like, my feedback is I don't think they want to do this job. Like they want, they maybe want the money or the prestige, but I don't think like deep down they need, they're going to do what we think we, you want them to do. They're like, what do you mean? And I mean, it, it happens a lot, right? So I think the, like the alignment on what people want in their life is, is a big one because I think if you, and if you fake want it, like it's, you get like a 70% real person, but not like full on. And I think the second one is, I think someone who doesn't have the depth because again, like, like I'm talking like you're, you're, we're building multi-billion dollar companies where everything's hard and it's like eating class. Like it's, it's hard, right? That you need someone who, you know, has, has the, has like the, the ability to like see and address things at every layer of your company, right? From, from the code to the emotions and, and seeing that like you're basically hiring people who are, who are full stack debuggers of, of things. And I think, um, I think people don't interview like, they're like, they're really, really good at like these two layers or they're really, really good. And, and, it's not that you have to be good at all of them and there's no perfect people, but actually out of the interview process, knowing that going, I think they're really good here versus there, like versus people just getting so in love with like, we spent three hours talking about this one layer of, of things. Right. I'm like, yeah, but when you throw them in this thing, there's other, other things are going to have to see <laughs> and, and at least know that before you, you say yes to the hiring process. So for me, that those are kind of the two, um, the two biggest mistakes I've seen. Jean-Michel, you've hired hundreds of people. What's been your biggest hiring mistakes, personally, where you're like, oh, I can't believe I did that, and you would have done something different in Dude, hindsight? I've done it so often. Like, for me, it's always when I'm rushed. And I tell you what, you're rushed a lot when companies are going gang gangbusters, right? Or you have, you've got pain. So I've, So one of the things I've tried to do to remove the rush because why, um, why, why just before we go into that why does it happen when you're rushed because you skip parts of the process because you i, I skip i i don't i don't do my three steps properly all the time i get rushed right and and for me like to get to know someone like it takes a while especially on the like when i talk about the snowboard test like it's not one chat it's a couple and then i like i, I do really want to dig that it's it's i I'll, I'll skip it and i'll like oh shit i saw that so what i do to not rush hiring now is when someone leaves 
I try to take the monkey off my back. And I, I always felt a huge amount of responsibility that when someone left on my team, especially a manager, that was like, I told their team, I've got it. Don't worry. I'll hire someone new. You know, they were always like, there's always a bit of unknowns and people don't like that. And at some point, either it's because I got older, I didn't give a shit, or I just was in so much pain that I, I remember sitting a team in a room once and their, their manager had left their VP, whatever. And I was like, you guys are all adults. You all are doing great work keep it up. What can I do to help? I have no idea if it's going to take me one week or six months to hire a replacement, but what are we shipping in the next six months that I can help with? And, and everyone put their hand, like everyone got super pumped about, it. I just brought it back to like, what are we, what are we here for again? Right? Like you guys, like you guys are all adults, right? You can drink, you can vote, you have kids, all that shit. Like let, let's do this, right? Let's, what, what are we shipping together? And I always bring it back to customers. Like, what do our customers need from us right now? It did not change, right? Yesterday, that person was there. Now they're not there. Nothing, nothing's changed about what we have to ship. How can I help do that? Right. And they go, oh, well, maybe we should do this and that. I was like, cool. Yes. No, that let's do some stuff. Sounds good. And then I would also, I'd go, listen, let's get ready that we might have not have someone in here for six months. So I took that stress off me. I was like, I'll take some of my time a bit. The second thing that happened is everyone just steps up. Like people, like they, they get jazzed about what we're doing, right? They're here, like they have left because they're still getting jazzed about doing this. And they get, they get jazzed about just like, I, I, I see their face light up when we start talking about what we're, what they're shipping and what they're working on. And, um, I think that connects me with them. It gives me a bit of time. And then I think I make higher, better, at least personally, I make better hiring decisions when I get a bit of time to, um, to get to know people better. Founders always say, I get it, I get it, but I need to hire now. I've, I've got X, I've got Y, I need to hire now. What do you say to them and to people who say, hey, a good hire today is better than a perfect one in six months time? <laughs> so the right answer is no, buy yourself some time. So this is, if you, one of the favorite books that I've, I've read about leadership is, um, I think it's called How to Negotiate Like Your Life Depends on It. Have you, have you ever read that one by the FBI Hush's Negotiator? Oh, oh, Chris, the Chris Voss one. The Chris Voss book, yes. Yeah, yeah, and if yeah, yeah, anything you learn about hostage negotiation is buy yourself some time, right? Yeah, like, I, did you remember I, the I, book I, in the first chapter? No, it was a long no, okay. time. No, okay, like, he's like... like <laughs> I literally like, I tell my kids about this because it, it, it taught me so much of just, you know, someone, someone, uh, has your kid as a hostage. They want a million bucks and you're on the phone with them. And the first thing you do is you've got a monkey on your back. Cause the hostage negotiator says, I need a million bucks tomorrow. And you're like, you have all these things you can say. And then like the, the, the thing you should do is just buy yourself some time. So you throw the question back and you go, how do I, how do I get a million bucks in a day? Like, that's a lot. And then the hostage negotiator has to think about that. Or like, oh yeah, that's a lot. Okay, I give you a week, right? So that's, I just remember that's the first example, which is buy yourself some time all the time, right? So so how do you buy yourself some time in a company as a, as a manager, as an exec? I'm like, take some monkeys off your back and get some people involved. Like, you know, like for me, getting people in the room and going, hey, that VP's not here anymore. Cool, but we still have customers. Let's keep going. Is buying some time and get people, like, let's get refocused on on what we're here to do. And that's buying time is important. Now this flip side of, Hey, we've got all these companies and I'm sure as VCs and investors are like, you have to hire great talent. Absolutely. So the other thing that I thought was really important was like, if I did not talk to a candidate every week, and I don't even call them candidate. If I, not, if I did not talk to someone that I'd love to work with every week as part of like my ongoing networking, I was not doing my job. Right. So I, I had this buzz flow of like, let's just talk to interesting people all the time. Like I'd ping, you know, C like CTO of Microsoft, like, Hey, Kevin Scott, like, I'd love to talk to you about some things that I'm, you know, like, cool, let's have a chat. Or I'd, or I'd talk to some, I'd see some really good blog posts. I'd talk to people. Right. So I think as a, as a leader, the, like there's no hiring process where you just start it and stop it. It's always, always going. So I think a lot of the, the, the CEOs that I work with in some of the smaller companies, I'm just always asking them like, have you talked to one person a week that at some point you want to, you, you want to work with? And then what happens if you do that one year, two years, three years, four years, you'll realize that when it's time and you're just going to know so many people that you want to work with, that one is like, it's going to be super amazing. And then you can start to figure out when you have time, you can look at your Rolodex and you can go, cool, let me go back to talk to those three people and figure out where they're at. And so you end up basically having an ongoing 
continuous networking of cool people that you want to learn from, that you can hire from. And then you buy yourself some time internally by just realizing, let's just not negotiate against myself and not be rushed. And for me, those those two things have been have been magical. It's interesting that we're talking about this adding to the team, because the thing that is so core to you is doing so much with, with little and actually the benefits of smaller teams. And we see everywhere, all over social, you know, AI will create the rise of, you know, billion dollar companies with one person whatever we want to call as that you know, headline grabber. I know it's a really shitty question, so forgive me for it. But how do you think about the future of code and the future of product when so much can be done now with such little teams? I absolutely love where we're at with um, AI and coding because it brings me back to 1988 when I, you know, I told our band leader that we didn't need the band to do a musical. So I've seen this playbook happen like what was that like 30 some years ago where I fired the band to do some music and I've seen the power of like the computers your your it's your co-pilot for doing things right and I um right now I I literally feel that giddy and excited about programming because I've got a co-pilot in my IDE and and I think it'd be crazy not to use those tools right like there's no musician now does not have a computer in the music studio right does, like it doesn't exist right like so I think we're just catching up now with a bunch of other trades where it's going to help us and and the way it helps me personally is you know it writes 80% of my code it doesn't write my architecture but it it the the programming AI tools now let me work on the hard stuff which is which is phenomenal and that's going to keep going and you know what's going to happen is we have a lot more software to write and that's what people don't realize like is there jobs in software development holy shit like healthcare um agriculture uh etc like educate like all these places that need technology have been completely underinvested we've got to distribute our programmers more than we have before and i think ai is going to make that completely more possible and i've never been as excited about um kind of being a programmer and a developer. What's been the single biggest game changer in the last two years for you writing code? I think having the AI co-pilot that I talk to nonstop. Like it, it's blown my mind. It does 80% of what you do. How far does it go up? Is there a point when it just becomes 99%? Quite, I'm not sure. It's kind of like music, right? In the music studio, it would, you know, give me my tempo... It would, um, I can do a lot of tweaking with sounds. I can invent new sounds, but I've got the tune in my head, you know? And I, I think, I think that's where, and it's hard to give it, I, I think that's kind of where we're, we're going to be at with, with computers. So do you think teams get incredibly smaller? Do they just ship more ship faster? How does that change I think the structure? Teams are gonna get, I, honestly, I love it. I, I think companies are going to unbloat and we're going to distribute programmers, Right. Like there's we've got a global you know, lack of procreation happening. We're going to have less and less people who can who can build technology where we need it. Like we need more efficiencies in agriculture and healthcare, in education in renewable energy. Like I think we're going to distribute these programmers that were making tweets boost on Twitter and Facebook. And we're going to distribute them more because we're, we are going to need less. But I tell you, I think the pie is going to grow in terms of the kinds of problems we can throw technologists to. And I think that's that's kind of what's going to happen. I'm just freewheeling here, but I'm enjoying this too much. I, I look forward and I, for the first time, I'm like uncertain of where to place bets. Because honestly, the size, speed and cash flow capabilities of incumbents is so strong that I don't think we've ever seen an incumbent set so strong and move so fast. Before, they've always been laggards. They haven't had data advantages. They're fucking brilliant now. Adobe, Microsoft, NVIDIA are moving faster than ever. How do you think about this? And am I right to be worried as an investor looking to invest in innovation? If you go back in the past, is there a time where there hasn't been the five incumbents that scare the crap out of you? Uh, no, you're always scared by the incumbents by nature, but they don't have the inherent capabilities and speed that they do today. They don't have the data advantages, which ties their products together so strongly. They don't have the cash flow capabilities of Microsoft doing $350 million a day in free cash flow. And they don't move as fast as they do today with people like Scott Belsky fucking dominating at the helm of Adobe. Yeah. He's been doing great. They scare, me more, they scare me more than Nokia did in 2007. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I'm, I, and this is where I think um, you and I spend time in different places. So I'm more, I look at things more as opportunities to build new things. And I've never seen as many, right? And I, I always get frustrated. I go to every government's website 
Like, actually, you know what the coolest thing to build right now? And this is where maybe from a VC, we might be at a point where we're actually building human infrastructure a lot more now, right? Which maybe the VC model might be busted. But you know what I need is a company. I need a country operating system. I bet you, like, if someone could come up with a country operating system, it's probably the next biggest, like, planet, well, be the richest company on the planet is a company operating system, which is how do you run a company, a country right now? Like, how do you run a country? Like, website, taxes, but like, all that stuff. Like, we are being, like, it's crazy how much crap software and technology we have out there. So, so for me, that's opportunity. You're seeing how do we make money out of it. I kind of don't care. I just think I want to make, you know, everything we touch um, better, right? Better customer experience, better product experience. So, I'm, uh, if I look at an opportunity, I'd love a company to build a country operating system. Requests for startups. My other big question is, you know, <laughs> but it's not. It's uh, it's like, but but how, how do you think about that? Right, like we might be at a point where we need more infrastructure than ever. Like we build, we've been building startups and things here and there. But how do we like? How do we do the rest? Right, like how do I electrify our roads? How do we do um, you know better intake system in hospitals? Data sharing. I I'm I see a lot of opportunity there. Well, I think that's what you're saying with the shift to hard tech investing, which. You know, is yeah. I think probably an embodiment of that in funding. Markets. So is that a word? Think, Do you guys use that hard tech? Yeah, yeah hard tech. It's, it's oh, exactly okay. as you said, like electrification, electrification of transport roads, uh, improvements in hospital facilities, and everything. Right, hard physical infrastructure in many ways within countries. Um, but honestly, I I fear that this is a different ball game. Um, having software investors invest in hard tech is a very different game. It is like you wouldn't have your sales team write code. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's a very different mindset. So I think a lot of people will get burnt there. But I agree with you in terms of the excitement around it. One thing that I'm always just really troubled by, honestly, is I've missed investing in a lot of the foundational model companies, always believing that there would be just a layer of commoditization there. Do you agree that the foundational model layer will be commoditized? Or do you think, how do you see that playing out? Obviously, it's harder to build a, it's like almost a platform company, right? Where you're building a foundational layer of the thing, right? The internet, hospitals, et cetera. It's actually a lot harder. Um, and you've got two exits, right? Someone's going to buy you because you're going to build the layer and they, someone else wants it. Um, or it's going to take you 20 years before you, you scale. But for me, I see it de-risk because I, I do, you know, on, I've been on the buying side of being in a bigger company going, Man, those that small company really, you know, they they push that platform in a cool little direction. Let's let's acquire them. So I, I see some. There's always two exits for platform custom companies that I think is is useful to think about, right? As you start looking at at at, at risks and um, so yeah, it's it's harder, but I think don't we? That's hard tech. We have to get better at doing harder things. So final question before we do a quick fire, but I'm really interested by this one. Sorry, and going back to we were talking about scaling teams earlier, and you talked about trajectory and growth. What are the reasons that great product teams and engineering teams go average why does that happen and how do you think about that wow that is such an interesting question how do you like how does every every team get pulled down and and not do to the best of their ability i think the one of the hard things about teams and building companies is it's really hard to pace yourself you know it's kind of like you're running a marathon you know like i don't know if you've done any half marathons and like there's always a pace bunny you know with a big sign I run a marathon a weekend and have done for two a year and a half. Well, there you go. Okay, so you know all about it. like the pace bunny. There's it's really hard to have a pace bunny for a company and a team, right? Yeah. And so, what do you do? So, I think I I'm a big fan of pace bunnying myself. I'm like, as a as a leader of a company, you should always be looking for your pace bunny. So, looking at what other people are shipping, looking at velocity of other teams. And, um, a lot of the people that I talk to where I'm like, I'm building my hiring pipeline or I'm learning something, I'm always going outside to like, you know, CTO at Spotify. I'm like, Hey, can you talk about how you do infrared on this? And do you talk about your last couple of incidents? What were they? You know, like always trying to like pace myself. I'm like, and often, you know, I'd be really hard on myself and go, Oh, actually we're all doing this shitty thing. And then sometimes I'd be embarrassed going, Oh my God, we can be so much better. So I think uh, a really good tool for, for, I think leaders is, um, build a pace bunny process of some sort where you can talk to enough people where you you build kind of an internal model of of what great looks like and then you bring that to your team and then you can you know you're obviously you know making sure you're surrounded by people who care about that but what's been the hardest thing about zero to one with the new company 
you know, I think it's so, di- maybe you'll tell me I'm wrong, but I think it's so different, you know, moving from the, uh, you know, scale that you were at with Atlassian and Shopify to zero to one. It's a completely different game. What was the hardest or most surprising element about that transition? I think that a lot of it's the same. I think the hardest part was it's, it is a bit more lonely and for a long time, like there's not a, like there's two of us and we're grinding and grinding. And, um, I think I, you know, there's a lot of friends at Shopify and people I could shoot the shit with and people who were in the same bucket. And I felt it was a bit lonely and, and it was a, a year grind that if you see some of my tweets, I had, I had some pretty, pretty low lows and pretty high highs. And I'd forgot, you know, huge respect for, you know, that first year or so when you're just, you're trying to pull the pieces together, you're trying to figure out what to build, what not to build. And how did you get through those hard times? Like I've had low lows and high highs. It's part of life, but what's the internal voice that gets you through them? My wife just pulls along. <laughs> She's my counselor and my cheerleader. Honestly, like, yeah, she, you know, some people don't bring their work to their, their spouses, but, um, I do a lot and she's kind of my, my life partner. And, uh, yeah, honestly, she's my biggest cheerleader. The fun part about building zero to one, two is it did let me try out a lot of cool companies, new products now that, you know, like you, you read about them on Twitter and you see, but now I'm like, actually like, Hey, let me use, you think that your new thing is really cool. Let me use it. So I've, um, I've met a lot of really good people by just, I'm going to use your product and I'm going to give you some feedback. And it's been, uh, it's been fun. Like I'll give you one example. One of the products that I'm really pumped about now is called equals.com. So get equals.com. And they're basically, and this is, I don't know if you, you guys probably know about them, but they're, they're doing something that's super subtle, but actually the more you use it, the more you see the value in it. It's kind of like, I'd never invest in this if I didn't use it day in, day out. And, um, because I think there's some innovation that comes out that's not deep tech, but that's changing how you use something completely. So um, Get Equals is basically taking the SQLers and the Excelers and giving them a shared data warehouse where they can work together. Zero investment. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm just, I just love using new things. We're like, holy shit, this changes how I work. I love that. And uh, no, I, I do know them. I, I... I think I think I saw that first round, but it was at some egregious price because they're out of intercom. And I, I mean, they're obviously very talented people, but it was like a 30 or a 35 million start. And I was like, you know, no, no mass. Uh, tough price to digest at that stage. Uh, but they're, but, they're building, they, a, but they're building a hard product. And this is, you know, um, I think to your question, Harry, right. About, you know, there's some startups who are solving some really hard problems where, it might take 50 million bucks to get a one Oh out. Right. And how do we build a VC culture where that's like, well, I, actually like, think that, I, I, think I think that harder problem is product marketing. Like, as you said that it kind of takes a couple of unravelings to see the beauty in the product. A lot of people don't have the patience to see it. A lot of people don't have the willingness to spend the time to see it. Uh, and then it's also in a very messy market where a lot of people say, Hey, we'll turn you into a data wizard. Hey, we give you data skills that no one else does. It's a messy product marketing challenge. And that's why you're a much better investor than I am. I'm a happy customer and I see how it changed my life, but I have no idea if this is a business or not. But well, my question, great my, my, no, no, I, I, listen, it's why actually, you know, be an interesting partnership as an investing partnership because you, you learn from each other. And the question then is like, well, is that viral spread within the loving customers? And what's the net yeah. new from each existing? So... Yes, <laughs> maybe I should ping Bobby. <laughs> um, you're right. Yeah, but I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't. I and wouldn't you're right. Like it. customer acquisition is is hard, and I think that's something I learned from Shopify and Atlassian is it's hard. So my my zero to one, the first thing I did is my co my you know my co founders are YouTube celebrities, so I'm like, okay, I've got that, I've got that part nailed, so I can go to market quickly. So what's the price point as well? I'm just looking now, because like, the ACV is important. Your CAC, your ACV. Yeah, I think they're they're marketing it as a business tool. So uh, pricing's kind of you know it's not a four ninety nine pricing. It's a it's it's going to be the data data layer for your company. And if you're not willing to pay forty nine bucks a month to like see everything that's happening in your company, like you're probably not the right tool. So they are. I think they're positioning themselves as a pro tool. Right again. Is there a pro tool market? I think there's some really good pro tools. You talk about Adobe, right? Some pro tools that have been uh, been successful. But I want to do a quick fire round with you, Jean-Michel. So if we start with what's the biggest problem you see CEOs make and what's the fix? I think CEOs um, underestimate go-to-market a lot, 
I think you talked about that. Like, how are they going to acquire customers and are they going to be able to create a movement around what they're building? And I see CEOs um, think they can do it, but don't realize the grind it's going to take over year over year. And I don't think they, I think they see the outcome of companies like Atlassian and Shopify who've been doing it for 15 to 20 years and assume it just happens, but it's, it's daily, daily grind to get people to care about what you care about. And that's, there's a saying, which I said, no one cares about where you're building. Like literally no one gives a shit about it as much as you do. And how do you get people to give a shit about it? I think. And, and it's not, and it's not something you layer on. I see so many people like, yeah, Harry, I know your, your content or your community or all that. We'll do it after the A. No, <laughs> it's not how it's not like build it, build it when you want to. It's like, no, 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 this will get you to the A. Um, tell me what's the biggest mistake founders make when hiring products and engineering teams. They hire too quickly. And, um, as a result, they, you know, they don't know what the capacity of their team actually is on paper. So I always wait till things break a couple of times before I add people. If you go back to the night before, you know, your first day at Shopify or Atlassian, what do you wish you could call yourself up and tell yourself? I started on the support team at Shopify and that was the best thing that I've ever done. And it's the only time I did it. I spent one month and I said, if I can't take customer phone calls for the product that I'm leading and I'm building, I should be fired. So um, I thought that was one of the best things I've ever did. Um, I learned so much about the product. I learned about the team. I learned about customers. And um, I turned out to be an expert user of Shopify. And I would recommend that Everyone starting a new job would literally start on the phones. What function has the most tension with engineering? I think the function that has the most tension is the, the design product and engineering, like that triad, right? That tension there, which is... Wow, okay. not sales, because sales is often the one that's said to, they demand things, they want customer changes, they want blah, blah, blah. That's interesting. Okay, what, that's true. So, so you've got two companies. I think there's some companies that are very sales-driven where absolutely... There's some tension around sales. I think there's a whole hour podcast we can talk about engineering leaders and how to how to manage that. It's not remove the tension, but how do you use the tension for good and not for bad, right? Because that's useful. And, you know, you can talk to Harley about this, but one of the things he did, well, he, he encouraged is I took over sales at Shopify for a year to remove. So I had 800 people uh, at Shopify that were in sales and they reported to the CTO for one year because we had a lot of tension. And we had to realign. Um, we had to decide on, you know, what customers are saying yes to and no based on not just what we want money wise, but what we want product market fit wise. And it got me really involved in, in, in helping with that tension, actually accelerating it. Right. And one of the things I did is like, I love sales, which is like, bring us the right customers at the right time. <laughs> And I think one of the biggest problems with misalignment of sales is sales bringing you the wrong customers at the wrong time. So if you can realign that and then you're like, well, what are the right customers at the right time? Cool. Let's talk about that. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I did for the one year when I was running sales. Um, and Harley was nice enough to hand me the keys for a year and then take them back, but was really realigning on that. And, and, you know, for us was deciding, uh, Shopify is going to be the biggest hype platform on the planet. We want to land all the celebrities we want to land the biggest uh, retailers that are having pain points. And we, we kind of listed, you know, and then, you know, we went ahead and, and built for that. We said, we don't want to land these kind of customers. And we went through and kind of redesigned, um, you know, who we want to land, focus the roadmaps on, on delighting the ones we want to land this year. And um, I think is, it is was... It a bit, uh, is, it, is it a bit of being everything to everyone? Landing the biggest brands in the world, landing Kim Kardashian, landing X and Y... But then also wanting mum and pop shop who's got a bakery and Toby well, actually, who started. Absolutely. But you know what? Is we found the similarities between them. So that's actually like, okay, let's peek into Shopify's product strategy was exactly that, right? So if you take all the retailers on the planet, right? And you organize them maybe as a, a bit more like a triangle, right? So there's complexity there's, and there's volume. Okay. Actually, if you, if you draw a line and you don't, you just look at complexity and volume, right? What you realize is that high volume and low volume merchants are often low complexity. And you're like, Oh, holy shit. They've got something in common. They're low complexity. What does low complexity for retail looks like? It's low skew count, right? Low, like just, they don't have a lot of, like, or not can't, but low skew count. 
they they're not selling like their 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 catalogs not a million things they've got one one website like so a mom and pop shop and kardashian have a lot in common so what are the differences holy shit kardashian's gonna do 70 70 thousand checkouts a minute okay let's let's solve that so that was our sales strategy was like we found some commonalities in the platform regarding these small merchants and large merchants have an 80 percent overlap let's fix the gap so that the 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 super, super large ones, you know, don't crash. We've got highest volume. Go at, let's go after Supreme. Like Supreme, again, like a fairly simple business, high volume. Let's solve that. And I'm like, I was like, hey, I think we have like five years of revenue in this bucket where we've got really good product alignment. Why are we going to, why are you trying to go close like FTD flowers? Like got the most complicated business on the planet that I'd love to get them. But if I can buy you some time by just getting the right customers at the right time, we have time to evolve the platform. We have time to do that. So I think that was, for me, was the biggest way of, it wasn't even removing tension. It was just put it at the right place. And that once we had that, I was like, why aren't you bringing us more customers? You know, then I can, I can put the gas on the sales team and, and, and get up there rear end and go, I told you what our product market fit. I want them all on the planet yesterday. And then they get busy. Sure, Michelle, I've loved doing this. This has gone in so many different twists and turns, which is always the sign of a great discussion. I always hate it when you stick to schedule. It's a sign of a crap show. This has been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, and I've loved doing this. It was a pleasure. We waited too long. And uh, again, sorry for the 20 million directions, but I, I hope it comes out good. So thanks, Harry.